In a darn lot fi hit gamon for and lead a gach to wacht. Cushiach John Gallagher as Dun Waro Annie Gillespie as a hini nan. In an own grat watch a gach a horla as Grafina he lohed. Ni ve kintu kuro le Gallagher idiv ilia na marah. I thought. This is a story where the deaths of a mother and daughter were lost in the court case. Their humanity and the tragedy of their deaths did not matter. It became about the perpetrator of the courts and the changing of a law that hadn't been reviewed since 1883. Annie Gillespie had married twice and widowed twice at a young age. Anne was born within the second marriage. When Annie lost her second husband, she decided to go it alone and so it was just her and Anne. Two peas in a pod and her mother adored Anne and they were very close. Anne was a beautiful redhead, loved fashion and makeup. Very stylish as we older generation will remember, the 80s was a very stylish era. She was well known in the area and went to the local school in Bally Buffet town in County Donegal. Unfortunately, as I stated earlier, they are not at the centre of this case. It is what would happen as a result of their deaths and the injustice because of the failings of our government, our laws and John Gallagher, the killer. John Gallagher grew up 15 miles from Bally Buffet in a town called Lifford. He was the youngest boy of a family of nine children. When he was 13, he was in a car accident and sustained serious injuries. Because of this, his parents often took a lenient approach to his behaviour. He didn't get on very well at school and had difficulty even with reading and writing. He had to be moved from one school to another several times. He ended up leaving school early and went to work with his dad, which gave him money to buy his first car. When he was 18, he attended a local disco and this is where he would meet the lovely Anne. She was just 14. She stood out to him because of her style and beauty and this gave him a certain status to have someone like Anne on his arm. Annie, Anne's mother, really took to John. He became almost part of the family. He even had his own key to their house so he could let himself in whenever he wanted. They really trusted him but there was red flags that weren't seen until it was too late. Friends and neighbours said that he was more like a father figure rather than a boyfriend. But the relationship stayed strong for three years until it came to a time where Anne was finishing school and she wanted to go out into the world and live her life and pursue her dreams. But John had different ideas. He thought they would marry and start a family. Anne ended the relationship when she turned 18 and John refused to accept this. This would become apparent to everyone when there was a local wedding and everyone in the locality attended including Anne and John, but not together. At the wedding, when another local boy asked Anne to dance, John went spare. He verbally attacked Anne, telling her she wasn't allowed to dance with anyone else ever again, and he'd make sure she didn't. Then he proceeded to punch the guy in the face. John was thrown out of the wedding and Anne was left shaken and afraid of him. John, a few days later, begged for forgiveness and Anne agreed to give him another chance. Whether she believed him or she was afraid of him, it's uncertain. They were out for a drive and John brought up the subject of the wedding again. He told her if she ever looked at another guy that he'd crash the car and kill them both. John had now become disturbing and unpredictable in his behaviour. Anne confided in her teacher of what was going on. She told her that John was going to kill her and that he had never been refused anything in his life. He had had three years of a relationship and was used to having control over her and now he was trying to hold on to that control. She told the teacher if she didn't get guard protection she was going to end up dead. That very same day John attacked Anne in her own home and tried to kidnap her. He dragged her out of the house towards the car. Luckily a neighbour heard her screams and came to her aid. He ran across the road and tackled John to the ground. Her family and friends told Anne to report the incident of the attack, which she did. John's behaviour was becoming more erratic. He was very distressed, he was angry and suffered from depression. Days later, the Gardaí found John on a bridge threatening to jump. His family arrived and convinced him to go to St. Conal Psychiatric Hospital for treatment. 
because John was in hospital Anne felt safe and she withdrew her statement of John attacking her. As soon as John heard this he discharged himself against the advice of the doctors. That Sunday the 18th of September 1988 Anne, her mother and uncle and his family went to Sligo General Hospital to visit Anne's grandmother. After the visit they were heading back to the car when John armed with a gun appeared. He pointed the gun at them all and the majority of the family ran back into the hospital, getting away. This was leaving Anne, her mother and uncle in the car. John pulled the uncle out of the car and took aim at him, but the gun didn't go off as it had jammed. John gave the uncle the choice to run and so he did, leaving the two women trapped in the back of the car. John took aim and shot Anne first, then went around the other side of the car and took aim and shot Annie. The two of them were dead in the back seat of the car with their arms around each other and Anne's head on Annie's shoulder with each other's blood spattered across them. I can only imagine what it was like for Annie to see her only child being shot and know you were only seconds away from the same fate. The whole thing must have been horrific. The events of this night though were only beginning. The Guardi arrived in John 22, jumped into his car with the Guardi taking chase. Several roadblocks were set up, John driving through the first one outside Ballyshannon and driving off St. Aaron's Pier into the sea. The Guardi jumped into the water after him and realised John had handcuffed himself to the steering wheel. They freed him and managed to revive him and brought him back to the same hospital where he had just killed Anne and Annie. As he arrived, their bodies were still lying in the back of the car in the car park. The bodies were removed from the car and their funerals took place on the 21st of September. Media were asked to stay away and so they did, out of respect for the family. The remains of both victims of Sunday night shootings were removed from Sligo General Hospital here a short time ago. The funerals will take place in Ballybofay, County Donegal tomorrow. Relatives asked that press photographers and cameramen would stay away from both ceremonies. The day after the funeral, John Gallagher was brought to the guard station after he was released from the hospital and was formally arrested and appeared in court that same day to be charged. He was asked if he had anything to say and he said, she was my girlfriend for three and a half years. I didn't mean to bring her to her death. On the 11th of July, 1989, John stood trial at the Central Criminal Court in Dublin, charged with the double murders of Annie and Anne. So this is where things go awry and will continue for years to come. You see, John claimed that on the night of the killings he was insane, but now he was sane again. This case now was not about two women being murdered, but a case about mental illness and human rights. John claimed he was taking large doses of slimming tablets weeks before the night of the killings and these had affected his mental state. His defence suggested to the jury that the only logical conclusion they could come to is that John was insane the night of the killings. The trial lasted seven days and after the jury deliberated for three hours, they found John guilty but insane. This means he was not criminally guilty. It was directed that he be detained at the Central Mental Hospital in Dundrum until further order of the court. One thing that was stated online with this kind of sentence is the uncertainty about it. Because you are going to a psychiatric hospital, you don't know what's going to happen or when you are going to be released or under what conditions you are going to be released under. Four months later, John applied to the courts to be released. This was to be the first of many applications for release on the grounds that he was sane now. The courts ruled that the verdict of guilty but insane meant he was now the government's responsibility in accordance with the Lunacy Act of 1883, an old law passed under British rule that was still in place in Ireland at the time John was convicted, which had long been changed in Britain but seemingly Ireland forgot to amend. The big scandal here is this law should have been changed long before this. This particular law had been reviewed in the 1970s the Henchy Committee drafted a new bill in 1978, but 10 years later, in 1988, the bill was still sitting there and not passed. 
While John was continuing his applications, the Gillespie family submitted an affidavit to the courts expressing their fears if John is released. And basically the judge told them that they had no rights in the legal process as victims or potential victims. Not much has changed there since. Victims and victims families are the last to have rights and it's still true today. After seven years in detention in the Central Mental Hospital, John finally lost his last application for release on the 6th of September 1996. Three High Court judges rejected his claim that his continued detention was unlawful. Okay, John, you said you give us a brief statement, so... Okay, very well, good. All I can say is I'll have to take time to study the judgment to see where I'll go from here. Well, did your solicitor say you could appeal the judgment? Well, that, I'll have to discuss that with my legal team, yeah. Well, what's your personal reaction to it? Obviously, I'll have to be take time to study the judgment and see what happens But there personally, after. how do you feel? At this point. Oh, well, I've, I'm a long time at this and I'll have to go another day. Yeah. Are you a bit disappointed? Obviously, I'm not too pleased. Thanks, John. Thanks for the time. Over the following years, as part of his treatment, John was granted more independence to help him adjust to normal life. He was allowed out on day release and held down a job locally. The fact that he was working showed that the medical professions were succeeding in the treatment that John was receiving. The first priority is to heal the individual that's sick, to keep both the public and the patient safe, it is said. However, in July 2000, whilst on day release, John disappeared. He left the mental hospital on a motorbike that he owned on the pretext that he was visiting a friend, but managed to leave the hospital with all his worldly possessions clothes, books, letters and photographs. One of them, it was said, was a picture of Annie and Anne. Why he was allowed to have this, I just don't know. He left at midday on Saturday on a bike like this one, except it was coloured yellow and gold. He left on the pretext of visiting a friend, taking his belongings, clothes, letters and photos. One of them is thought to feature his former girlfriend Anne Gillespie and her mother Annie. John made it as far as the UK and was living in London with a woman but he was completely broke. Through a contact that the news of the World Tabloid paper had, they got in contact with John to tell his story for £12,000. A thousand pounds for every year he was in the mental hospital. They agreed even though they couldn't pay him on moral grounds, but John didn't know this. The newspaper got in contact with the Gardaí and they arranged with the police in the UK to pick up John when the journalist was with them. So the journalist met John in a car park in Oxford and they were all sitting in the car when they were surrounded by 20 armed police. Doors of the car swung open and John was dragged out and was held under the British Mental Health Act. The police brought in their own psychiatrist and were in contact with the mental hospital in Ireland where John was being held and it was decided the English police had no grounds to hold him. Because of this decision, John was free to wander the world as a free man, except in Ireland. If he went to Ireland, he would be put back into the mental hospital. For the next 12 years, little was heard from John until prime time, an Irish current affairs TV show in Ireland managed to track him down in Straban in County Tyrone in Northern Ireland, which is the UK, a five minute drive from the border of the Republic of Ireland. If John was to take that five minute journey to his hometown of Lifford or any other part of the Republic and found by the Gardaí, he would be brought straight back to the mental hospital. So the journalist in 2012 from the primetime TV show asked him for an interview on how he managed to escape the mental hospital. The interviewer handed him a letter of questions and John tore it up in front of him and said he was under no obligation to explain himself. He warned the journalists to leave, and so he did. A month later, the same journalists got a phone call late at night to tell him that John had crossed the border into the Republic of Ireland and had turned himself into the Central Mental Hospital in Dublin. Nobody was expecting it, but our John had a plan. John asked to be examined and he was deemed sane and a few weeks later was discharged from the hospital. A sane, free man with no conviction of the murder of Annie and Anne. They were conditions, one of them being he was to stay away and have no contact with the Gillespies. The killing of Annie and Anne shone a light on the laws when it came to mental illness. 
In 2006, a mental health review board was established. The board decided to replace the verdict of guilty but insane with one of not guilty of an offence by reason of insanity. The act had to be amended again in 2010 to include the power to recall a patient if they breached the conditions of discharge. What is scandalous is the length of time it took for our lawmakers, the politicians, to rectify the laws. And why does it always take a tragedy to get it done? As I said, John Gallagher will never have a criminal conviction for the killing of Annie and Anne. He returned to Straban in County Tyrone after his release and rebuilt his life and no up-to-date information can be found on him. When Annie and Anne were killed, the whole of that side of the family line was wiped out in one fell swoop. Anne was Annie's only child. That branch of the family has gone forever.